Good morning. Um, I am uh, Biban Kidron. I'm a crossbench peer in the House of Lords in uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and I'm also founder of an NGO called Five Rights Foundation. And, and we work at the intersection between childhood and technology. And I just want to say before we get our session going, what an incredible privilege it was to sort of be listening in to Katina there demanding a better world, a better digital world for all of us and her absolute optimism that it's about to come down the pike. And I have to say, I'm not one of her students, but I definitely would like to join her movement. So during this uh, session, we're going to ask you to use the Q&A board to ask questions. And I will, towards the end of the session, uh, try and put your questions to our panel. Um, shortly, I'm going to introduce um, my colleague who will talk about our work with IEEE, uh, IEEE, which is to develop an age appropriate framework for published terms. Now we at Five Rights are very excited about it. And we believe that when it comes into the public domain, it may well be a game changer because in considering how to uh, look at published terms, you actually end up thinking about what the published terms offer. Uh, we really do celebrate the role of collaboration in this arena. And we have had uh, contributions from, from engineers, from uh, academics, from business, uh, uh, from actually policymakers, even regulators, and actually the enforcement community uh, across the world as we have developed our age appropriate published terms. And I think that this conference, I think, sort of uh, uh, embodies what we have been living for the last year or 18 months in pulling together technology and the needs of society and considering what public interest is uh, in this space. So I believe that there are sessions on racial justice, on environmental justice, uh, some, some uh, on the role of education, but this session focuses specifically on the rights of children and young people. And maybe we should call it intergenerational justice, just to be uh, mirroring your language. But it's really important that in the conversation that we have, that young people are not seen as passive recipients of technology and or technology education, but as full citizens in their own right. And, and we find that they are forgotten in some of the biggest conversations about technology and they are marginalized for their age. Children are one in three of the world online population. And if we design a world that is only suitable for adults, then actually one in three of the online population are simply unseen and unheard. And getting age appropriate published terms is part of this story. So let me uh, go straight away to our first speaker. Um, I'm very proud to introduce my colleague, my friend, Dr. Reese Farthing. She is the director of projects here at Five Rights Foundation. She came to us from an academic background of co-developing policy with marginalized young people uh, and trying to realize, trying to help them realize their economic, cultural, and social rights. And she is going to set out uh, the background to the issue and, uh, and a, a glimpse of the work that we've done so far. Reese. Well, firstly, thank you very much for that um, introduction. It's really fantastic to be here and just to um, hear the enthusiasm um, around this project is incredible. Um, I've been tasked as the sort of background information panelist and I'm taking that brief seriously. Um, I'm gonna start at the beginning if I can by highlighting that as Bebo mentioned, the size and scale of young people's digital lives is truly staggering. There's now over a billion children and young people online and every single day another 170,000 go online for the first time. And as I'm sure we all saw this year, COVID has done nothing but absolutely amplify this. One US survey that happened over the summer found that now nearly half, nearly half of American children were spending six or more hours a day looking at screens, up 500% from pre-COVID levels. 
or in Ireland, around 70% of children increased um, use of their smartphones, they upped their use of social media, and two thirds of them increased their use of gaming consoles all at the same time. Now, a lot of this was driven, as we all saw, by the move of education online, but also other aspects of young people's lives moved online too, like all their social life, their interaction with friends. So now we can clearly say that young people live on and offline seamlessly, and this is just their life. And for us as a society, this creates some new obligations for us. Just as we want our young people to flourish offline, we must want them to flourish in the digital world as well. Um, and we really need to protect and promote their rights in this digital world to achieve this. Now, we are seeing moves in this direction. There have been legislative and regulatory responses worldwide to this, from online harms legislation, such as that being put forward in the UK or that enacted in Australia or Rwanda recently, to international actions, such as there's a general comment being drafted by the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child to enshrine children's rights in the digital world. But outside of regulations and law, which you know, lawyers and politicians love, children's rights need to be realised absolutely everywhere, including in the design and delivery of products and services. Now, this must be everything from the way we design features on social media platforms to the algorithms we create that recommends them content, right through to the terms and conditions that we create for these services. And that's what we're talking about today, terms and conditions, T's and C's, or as we all know them, the fine print that you click I accept on at the start of using any service. More formally, we refer to these as published terms, which covers everything from terms of service documents, privacy notices, cookies, policies, and, and countless others. Now, the reason we're talking about these terms is because they're important. They set out the rules of engagement between a product and a service user. And it's incredibly symbolic then that they've become absolutely infamous for the unfair power asymmetries between users and tech companies that they cement. I've seen them described variously by academics and lawyers as the most pernicious violations of consumer expectations and once even as sadistic, harsh words. Um, but more specifically, they're criticised for being click through, excessively long, deliberately drafted in a style that actively discourages reading and for binding people to terms and conditions without any meaningful consent. And that's just for adult users. For young digital service users, the problem is even more acute. I'm going to talk us through five of the big problems we see for young users. Firstly, in terms of presentation, we've got a really big issue. Quite apart from the services um, that are clearly aimed at young people, most children spend their time on mainstream services. Now, terms and conditions are not presented in age-appropriate formats on these mainstream services at all, nor indeed even in the services for children. Everything from legal jargon to simply relying on plain text where the whole rest of a service or website is designed to within an inch of its life to absolutely maximise user engagement, terms and conditions are presented in plain black and white font, making it all too easy to click through without reading. Secondly, we've also got a really big problem in terms of offering fair terms. Terms quite often fail to meet basic consumer law obligations especially around informed consent and parental consent for young people. Thirdly, terms just really often, they just obscure the fact that the service in and of itself is not age inappropriate. And the terms and conditions somehow become used as a tool that, that justifies its inappropriateness. For example, you know, we've seen terms and conditions that have asked young people to click, I agree to fundamentally inappropriate things like consenting to having your data collected and sold for marketing purposes, or consenting to turning on your location sharing services on social media that, you know, we know it does things like it broadcasts their location to adult strangers. You, you know, fundamentally, you just cannot click I agree to having your rights violated nor having laws broken. Fourthly, terms often make this really weird and inappropriate trade-off between young people's rights and commercial and business incentives. By choice, terms and conditions are created to create the best relationship for a product or service and its consumer interests, 
before the needs and best interests of their young users. For example, in-game purchases link seamlessly to default payment settings on operating systems. Business models are driven by profit and sales maximization, but that does not mean that they should run roughshod over what's in our best interest for children. And lastly, terms and conditions have this kind of, I don't know, this inclination towards inappropriately responsabilizing young people and parents. By this, what I mean is that terms and conditions create these wildly inappropriate responsibilities for safety and data privacy for parents and young users. Think, we default to this low safety mode unless you, the user, or your parents switch all of these features off. I mean, why are we thinking that young people and their parents are best placed to do this? It's like a baby seat manufacturer saying, it's up to you, toddler, and your mum to calculate if this seat has the right features to avoid terminal velocity in a car crash. These responsibilities must actually instead rest with the service and the product providers first, because they're the experts who built these products in the first place. So fundamentally, we've got this big problem that many terms are just wildly inappropriate for young people, and it's incredibly important. Getting terms right for young people is both a moral, legal, and business imperative. So as Katina talked earlier about, there's a huge moral imperative for this. Young people's rights as codified in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, they actually apply to young people wherever they are and wherever they go, including online. And there can be absolutely catastrophic effects when these rights aren't realised. Think unlike online harms where terms and conditions allow young people to be recommended or even introduced to adult strangers, or offline harms where we share their, rough, their actual sort of geophysical location or we allow dangerous misinformation to spread. Terms and conditions need to be changed in ways that create the conditions to realise children's rights. Legally too, we're seeing regulators increasingly acknowledging the importance of terms for young people. For example, in the UK, we recently enacted a piece of sort of, um, you know, incredible world-breaking legislation in the age-appropriate design code, where it spends a full paragraph making it a requirement for any information society service that's likely to be accessed by children, which is a very expansive target in itself, to present terms and conditions in ways that are clear and accessible. Or internationally, that general comment on children's rights in the digital environment, which I mentioned earlier, requires every state that's ratified it. Now, at this stage, I need to point out the UNCRC is the most ratified document around the world. So this has huge implications for states. States are now required to require businesses to establish and implement regulatory frameworks and terms of service that adhere to the highest standards of ethics, privacy and safety. But fundamentally, it makes good business sense. We heard earlier about IBM making moves into sort of more ethical business models and businesses trying to adopt that. New startups investing in privacy enhancing technology and services have never been in more demand. And the drive for sort of ethical business and ethically you know, trained staff is absolutely increasing. And this includes consumer demand for ethical digital services. So basically what we've got is there's a real problem with terms and conditions for young people. And there's a real drive on the other hand to find a solution. So that's the agenda that I was setting out as the sort of agenda setting panelist. But I'd like to just add that at Five Rights, we're also working on solutions. We're doing some research around this issue and working with children and young people too, which I believe Ephraim is going to talk to you a little bit about later. Um, but we're also currently working with the IEEE to support a working group who are trying to develop a standard around published terms that will provide an absolute framework for service providers about how to actually create age appropriate terms, addressing everything from how to actually present your terms um, to what your terms actually need to set out. So what are the conditions that your terms need to create? And I think Elpesh is going to speak to us a um, later a little bit more about the capacity of a standard in this space. So I'm gonna finish if I can now by extending an invitation to anyone who's so inclined um, to join the standards working group and help us to really craft these solutions as well. Thank you so much, uh, Reese, for that uh, contribution. And um, indeed, I would like to invite 
anybody list uh, comments and questions and, and thoughts into the uh, Q&A as, as we talk. Um, and just to say that the work on of the working group over the last months has really gone very, very carefully and, and fully through all the aspects of design in, in the, uh, that might be impacted by published terms. And we've actually had to pray for, for contributions uh, to our work after this event. Uh, let me turn to Ephraim uh, Luemba. Uh, he's currently based at the University of Nottingham's Horizon Center for Doctoral Training. He's worked in the digital marketing, ind uh, marketing industry, which I think gave him uh, pause for thought. Um, and uh, he thought maybe uh, the uses of personal data on the web were not quite. And he's recently been working with us at Five Rights uh, to develop recommendations around public, st public standards for children and young people. And um, let me first ask you, uh, Ephraim, you know, your research has been really focused around questions of privacy and personal data. And I know you did a recent audit of services. And I'd really love you to sort of explain to us what some of the key problems uh, came out of that audit for you. Uh, th thank you, Biban. Um, yeah, I, I have been doing an audit um, of the services that are targeted at young people, um, and I defined those services based upon um, some data that I, I, I found on Amazon Alexa, uh, teen and kid-focused uh, websites. Um, and I think there are a few things that came out of that uh, that audit. I think. Some, some of the things that um, are particularly important to keep in mind are that on a lot of the websites that are um, quote unquote targeted at young people, um, the strategies that services use in order to um, show privacy information and um, terms of service and other published terms are exactly the same as the ones that they um, use for for adults, uh, and as, as Reese was saying, um, these strategies tend to be that uh, the terms are written in uh, very long and legalistic language. Um, they're targeted in ways that make it uh, difficult for people to understand who the, who the users user base are. Um, and I think one one of the most interesting things that I found from it was that a lot of the guidance that is actually available out there for young people um, for, for presenting policy information and uh, published terms to people is not actually um, heeded on most websites. So I looked at a hundred um, services and found that 90% of them, uh, for example, put their privacy policy in the footer of a website. Um, and a very large percentage of them were also not um, using any 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 sort of strategies for simplifying the information. So um, the most that you'd find is like a header um, saying, this is how we collect your data, uh, this is how we use your data, um, and this is who we share your data with, and no ways of splitting out that information um, in ways that makes it more uh, usable for any user, not even a young person. That's a, it, it's really fascinating that, that whenever we talk about young people in terms and uh, with adults, they always say uh, immediately they say, um, "Oh, but I have the same problem." I just wonder, you know, obviously, you know, from a five rights perspective, we think that that children deserve a higher bar, and we have a duty of care and. So and I was also interested in uh, a piece, and I wonder whether you felt that they had more creative solutions uh, than adults. Um, and I know you've actually got a little bit of a video for us, uh, which I'm hoping that someone's going to play. And maybe after we play the video, you can actually explain some of the ideas that the young people had. But if I uh, understand it rightly, you ask them to come up with a list of should and shouldn'ts to tell the conference audience. 
Yes. Uh, so we do have that video from some young people who we spoke to in a COVID secure youth club in the southeast of England, um, and we can share that with you and uh, discuss after. We think that the shoulds that people should do for terms and conditions is make it presentable for everyone to agree. So for everyone to be able to know what they're agreeing to. Um, another is that they should put an audio button so they will read it out for you. So we won't have to read it ourselves. And also if you're blind or, you know, you can't actually read it yourself, someone else will read it for you so you can hear it instead of reading it. Also, if there is a lot of information to consume, you can put it into different sections. And in the beginning of the terms and conditions, you can use like subtitles and put an index so that people can see exactly what they need to go through and address their worries. Another is get to the point. So bullet points, shorter sentences, shorter paragraphs, not masses and masses and masses of writing. It just no gets one wants to read that. Yeah. Um, the next one is to not make it boring. Um, obviously, a lot of people will just get unengaged after a while if, you know, if the terms and conditions are a bit boring or if they use too much complicated language. It shouldn't just be an agree. There should be a disagree button just in case you don't agree with what they're doing. You don't agree on them collecting your data and tracking other other apps you go to and other websites. And they shouldn't use jargon, which is basically tricking people into agreeing. So you have to, sh you have to show exactly what they're agreeing to. And don't make it too complicated. So use words that we would, we would hear, we would use on a day-to-day -day basis and not like those big, big words that we wouldn't understand. I mean, that's absolutely brilliant because in one fell swoop, they really focus in on a number of things that the working group, this very expert working group have spent 18 months sort of identifying. And here you have two young girls sort of coming up with it in a moment. What, what else did you get out of speaking directly to these young people? Yeah, no, it was an excellent opportunity. I, I think some of the things that they mentioned there um, really um, point to a problem that um, that we have that's linked not only to the way that the terms and published terms are presented to people, but um, a level of um, a, a way that the practices are shown to be um, disproportionate to what you'd see in real life. Um, one thing that we mentioned, um, that was mentioned by the young people in, in our workshop was that the, there was a disproportionate level of, um, there were disproportionately long and the practices that were displayed on display were um, also disproportionate to uh, what people got from the services. One of the young people said that they would be inclined to read published terms, for example, if it was in a situation that was useful to their life, so consequential, like going to university, but not necessarily social media. And that goes to a deeper, um, a deeper uh, problem with the volume of the terms and conditions that they see. Um, and I think another thing, um, and I think this was one of the most important points to me personally, was that, um, when the young people um, looked at some of the examples of uh, published terms that we had, um, we, we had uh, cookies notices that we showed them and um, examples of privacy policies. Um, they talked about how the way in which the information is presented to them um, would nudge you to accept, accept, accept. But I found that uh, the way that they understood it was that the, there was no clear way to really improve on the way that the data is presented without making it either too long and um, therefore too difficult to um, understand or keeping it too short. Um, and when it's kept too short, th there was a level of confusion that they had about it. Um, 
but they they thought that this should be the responsibility of the services themselves rather than the young people. You know what, that's absolutely fascinating because I think that I probably have had that argument with a couple of uh, uh, tech platforms myself. Um, and, and I want to ask you, and this is something we really did find in the working group. Um, I, want, I want to ask you whether you think that that is actually because fundamentally those published terms are, are covering up so much that is inappropriate for those young people that you can't, in all conscience, make it short and true. And so we have this sort of absolute sort of tension between actually making it short and revealing a, a, perhaps an unpalatable truth. Precisely. Um, one of the things that one of the young people said to us was um, that they wish that they had the choice to um, really decide how their data is being used. Uh, but the way that the sites and the services present the information to them um, often misleads them. Um, one person said that they weren't really sure what a cookie notice was until quite recently. They thought it was um, a, a reward that a site gave you for signing up to their services. Um, and they use a lot of really confusing language um, that the young people don't understand. But one of the young people pointed out that perhaps that's because they don't really want you to know what they do with your data. Perhaps that's because if you did know, everybody would say no. Um, and this is a problem that you have with cookie notices um, in general. You, you have a accept all button and you have a manage your choices button. Um, specifically telling you that if you accept all, you get to click through and enjoy the site. And if you have to manage your preferences, there's this long thing that you have to read um, and you may not like the choices. Um, so I think, yeah, that's definitely a very big problem. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also, um, I, I remember actually being in a workshop and watching in front of my eyes, uh, a young child, I think they were sort of 12 or 13, invent two-factor authentication <laughs> in, 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 you know, they didn't, they hadn't sort of worked out that, that it already existed. And it was sort of a genius moment when we set them the task of trying to solve a problem. Now, I happen to know that uh, one young person uh, did suggest that they have personal terms. And I wonder whether you could just explain what personal terms are and whether you think that's, that's, that's a goer for the rest of us to consider that as a possible solution to the problem you're describing. Sure. Uh, yeah, this was uh, something that was actually brought up by, um, by a few young people I know that um, uh, Five Rights have spoken to before. And I think on a broader perspective, personal terms have been tried before in, in a realm of ways. Um, and what personal terms are basically is you would have your own privacy preferences that you um, have an idea for, and you'd set them at some point at your leisure, um, and then allow websites and services to read those in a machine readable way, so that um, you wouldn't have to constantly accept things. You have your personal terms that you've set at the beginning of your process. And then um, once you've set your personal terms, you don't have to change them. And the websites have to come to you uh, to say yes or no um, to, to, to the terms that you've set. Uh, and I think young people thought this was a good idea, uh, both in our own uh, research, but also um, in other research that I've read before. Great. So I, I, I want to actually just finish by by uh, making an observation and, and asking you if you have had a similar uh, experience. In that short clip that you showed us, um, there was an incredible generosity from one of the young girls about accessibility and, and this idea that we should look after uh, people who, who perhaps aren't coming to this technology with all you know, all available routes, all available personal tools, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and you know, I've, I've, I've noticed this before. I've noticed young people saying, why don't we have accessibility tools 
on and then we switch them off for the more, you know, for more able uh, bodied folk, etc. I just wonder whether that's something that is a theme in your work, whether whether young people are very sort of specifically concerned about that because it wasn't something that came up in the same depth granular depth in uh, in the working group i must i must admit yes um as you saw some of the young people mentioned that it would be useful to have uh, something like subtitles um on uh, your personal terms kind of by default um and another thing that i thought was um very pertinent uh, as it relates to accessibility was that they also thought that um, personal terms should be read, al read aloud as, as a default as well. Um, uh, and that you should have the opportunity to switch that off, but it should be as accessible as possible uh, on the first port of call, as a first port of call. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that. And I'm sure people will ask you questions and I do encourage people to put their questions in the Q&A uh, for a little bit uh, later. Um, I'm now really um, happy to introduce uh, Alpesh Shah. He's the Senior Director of the Global Business Strategy and Intelligence at the IEEE Standards Association, where his focus is on organizational, organizational growth and advancements of ecosystems towards accelerated outcomes. Prior to joining the IEEE, Alpesh worked as an advisor to various organizations organizations with a focus on organizational growth. But I have to say that Alpesh has been a great friend to Five Rights, and uh, we've asked him to talk from his perspective um, about, um, about some of the work that we've been doing together and the intersection between standards and rights and, and sort of whether this is in fact a, a an important part of the ecosystem. Now, my understanding is that I can't see Alpesh, but that we are about to hear him. So uh, I hope that is in fact the case. And, and, and Alpesh, can I, can I first ask you just about some of the, the things that, that Ephraim has been saying about, you know, there's this incredible creativity amongst kids to, to um, to find solutions. And I just wonder from your perspective, you know, where you think, who you think the stakeholders are in solutions and where you think standards fit into that stakeholder mapping. Sure, uh, thanks for throwing me a softball there, Eva. Um, <laughs> no, I, 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 first off, I, I just wanna thank you and, uh, and uh, Tina and the team here for, for inviting me for uh, a tremendous day and a tremendous conference with uh, such a uh, you know such a proven group of speakers. I I really appreciate the comments made earlier, both by Reese and Afram, and um, I think when we think about the stakeholders, uh, I've always thought about it from the aspect of it, it always has to start with the child and then work its way out from there. But too often, uh, it's been the other way around. And so <clears throat> as we're thinking about things expanding and growing and we look at the role of standardization, really standardization is a great tool to help harmonize, to drive interoperability and to offer greater access to innovation. And to Beban's earlier point about you know, the role it plays within the ecosystem as well, it plays a very critical role in that uh, when it was mentioned earlier in terms of service providers offering solutions that are better catered towards children, you know, part of it is we need great diversity and also perspective in the innovators that are coming in as well. And at a time, 95% of, if you think of even the US economy, uh, was really driven by small, mid-sized enterprises. And many of these players may not understand, may not have access, may not have the ability to develop the right types of solutions as well. And so thinking about it from a standardized fabric where the access to the uh, libraries and um, the open source platform and a children's stack really, if you can imagine that, upon which they could build. And this idea of code as law, if you will, 
sort of being accessible to them starts to improve and increase the ability for the ecosystem to move in the direction that you've heard Eben mention and speak about for quite some time. You've heard Katina speak about earlier. You heard Reese talk about it. You heard it from the examples from Ephraim. And you'll hear many folks talk about the concepts as well throughout uh, the day in the past few days. And significantly to all of this is a, an age-appropriate design framework. This is something that Biban and Reese and Ephraim and a number of, <coughs> of, of folks have started to really come together and the Five Rights Foundation really helped drive this idea of imagine if you could really lay out a common approach where that these ideas of the terms and conditions, these ideas of parental rights, where these ideas that are really even reflected through these 16 elements of the ICO are accessible, are addressable, are achievable in a mechanism where others can deploy it in a in not only in a manner where they do it right, but in a manner that's also cost effective, right? That's that's the additional benefit of standardization here. And when we think about it from the ecosystem perspective, how do we make the ecosystem better, rich, ground more fertile? Standards also give the opportunity for us to think about certification and imagine those age-appropriate design terms and conditions where every one of those service providers and every one of those companies that have stepped up to the plate and made those TNCs more accessible, living in a registry. So now you've made it easier for school systems to go there and identify what are the right software, what are the right solutions. And imagine for parents and the PTAs around the world having a clear ability to understand where is the data compromising our students and their futures. These are all elements that are quite feasible through standardization. And the point I really think that is necessary and is being driven by all of the speakers here is that it's really important to be accountable today for the future by taking proper action. And standardization is one mechanism to help us take a step forward in that direction. Um, uh, do you know what? That was so wonderful. And I have to say, I almost broke into song when you were building up your imagine, imagine, imagine. I, I, I do spend a lot of time imagining uh, just what you say, and I think it's a powerful picture. And it leads me to ask you another question, which is one of the things, and, and, and I speak now a little bit, uh, you know, as in my role as a legislator, that one of the issues we always hear for, or one of the obstacles, should I say, is, uh, you know, reasons for inaction is, ah, this is a global problem, so we can't solve it on a national level. And, and, and actually, so long as we see it that way, um, you know, everybody's in some sort of checkmate. But it strikes me that standards uh, don't necessarily have to observe national boundaries. And I just wonder whether you could talk a little bit about that and about how, how it might help us, you know, knock that particular sacred cow off the, I don't know, I'm in the middle of, I'm in the middle of a sentence I can't finish, but, <laughs> but how it might help us attack the jurisdictional problem. Sure, I, I think, you know, when, when we look at Wi-Fi technologies, your Wi-Fi for your laptop works wherever you go. IEEE is a global standardization body. Many of the standards that come out of IEEE work across borders, across the world. You look at our medical device work as well. And, and really, I think what it boils down to is context on one front. But I think the other problem is really um, something that we were talking about a little bit earlier, which is just folks getting over that hump, feeling the ability that they can really contribute in a meaningful way and having access to those tools so they can start doing it. Part of it is building capacity. Now there's this other part of the current, let's say, players in the space. And for some, there's, there's this uh, statement of it can't be done, it's too hard. But you know, honestly, we hear that about many things, mm -hmm. right? But that's not a reason not to do the right thing. And what we are talking about today is doing the right thing. And doing the right thing in this case means taking the proper steps forward, showing folks it can be done, showing them how to do it, and then enabling them to move forward with it. 
I think I think the other thing that maybe is an observation worth making, and I'd be interested to know whether you see this really either in market terms or whether you see it in terms of soft power. But you know, I think that when we talk about um, uh, tech companies, we sort of have you know a handful of tech companies in mind. But actually, if you think about it, uh, most um, advanced businesses are in some way. At tech companies. And so actually, there is a, a culture shift. And many, many of those companies don't necessarily have the same interests and, and do have a specific and corporate commitment to young people. And do you see this work around, you know, what you uh, refer to as the children's stack, uh, a, a sort of, you know, a, an opportunity for those companies? I do. I, I see it as a as a great opportunity for the established businesses. I see it as a great opportunity for uh, those that are starting their businesses now, and I see it a great opportunity for those coming in. You know, you asked me at the very beginning, Bivan, uh, about uh, this idea of who are we really designing it for, and who are the key stakeholders, and and where are we right now? And really, you've already started. Five Rights has already started taking the the necessary step, right? You you've already started working with children. Getting that, getting their input into here, I, I think of even the, the terms and conditions um, problem statement, and and there's really no reason why we can even think about that becoming some sort of captcha instead. You know, as you go in to think about what are the elements here that can be visualized in many ways as well. In the same vein, uh, the established businesses may also be in a position where they may get disrupted through through a lot of what needs to occur, and so. Yes, I think either it's it's either they they want to do it or they'll be pressured to do it or, you know, they opt to see others do it and then sort of access through it through that way. Okay, I'm gonna actually uh, just uh, sort of finish with one thing, which is actually one of the things that we keep on hearing uh, children say is that they want consistency. And it struck me as you were speaking is that's what you're offering. IEEE is offering kids the consistency they crave. Have you found other user groups who have that same desire? For consistency? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, if, I, if I were to think about just the various stakeholders, I think everyone is looking for consistency because that consistency can help lead towards proper policy in place as well that complements it so strongly. And when, when that's in place, you know, it becomes almost a part of normal course of business then. So where we've seen it, uh, we, we see it amongst uh, not only small and mid-sized businesses, we've seen it amongst the NGOs that are involved. We even see it amongst some of the, the major companies that are offering um, toys for children's or are in the space. And it's more and more around the cursory sides, we're seeing more folks starting to come into this, this space as well with an interest to see this, because for them, it gives them a nice pivot point. That's fantastic. Now, I may well come back to you because we have some questions uh, from our audience and please do keep them coming. But I'm actually gonna uh, take one of these questions and, and go back to Reese here, because someone said, uh, what are the most urgent requirements in helping young people in this space? And in a sense, the work of the working group sort of identified what they thought were two obstacles and four huge positive drivers. And I wonder whether you could just sort of extrapolate those for, for, for us. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you, Biban. Um, I mean, it's an interesting question because this is exactly what the working group um, that we've set up with the IEEE um, that we're working to support have been grappling with for, for quite a while now, trying to work out actually, if you put it in a nutshell, what is it and what is it that service providers can do to break down those barriers and go forward? Um, and we've sort of created four, four, four categories of, of things that service providers need to do to make their terms and conditions age appropriate. Firstly, the big one that's, that's the easy go-to, I think, which is about age-appropriate presentation. So making sure that where you do have terms and conditions, young people can actually access them, you know, in, in multiple formats, in a language that they understand, in a way that appeals to them. So the information actually is accessible to them. Um, the second sort of thing that the driver that we thought they could come up with um, is, is the idea of 
you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. There is actually a legal concept of fair terms um, in consumer law, and it's actually quite developed. And actually, if service providers and product developers actually took a look at what were fair, fair terms in the legal sense and applied those um, into their own terms and conditions, you'd immediately get this, this bump um, in, I guess, the interactions between young people and a service provider and improvement in, in the rights and the realisation for young people. The third thing that the working group sort of centred around was this idea that, and again, you don't have to build everything from the start. We do have this huge canon of children's rights and children's rights law. And actually that has all sorts of principles in it that are applicable in a digital setting as well. So from things like um, best interest, which actually talks about what's the role um, of, you know, or how is it that when you're looking at your business model and your business maxim, how do you balance what's right for your business and what's right for the child? And actually it points out that actually what children need and children's rights has to always be the paramount consideration um, when you're interacting with children. So if we can get terms and conditions to be compliant with children's rights, all of a sudden we start to reshape the offer that young people and children are able to access. Um, and then the, the final sort of bucket in terms of the good things that service providers can do, um, it sounds really obvious, um, but it's just not done very often. Um, it was as simple as recognising children. Um, so there's this idea that actually a lot of service providers actually do provide services or products to huge volumes of young users and quite often young users who have specific needs or specific issues. Um, but because they don't necessarily claim to target them, um, they, they just pretend that they don't have young users so their terms and conditions don't need to be fit for them. Um, and so actually there was a kind of first and obvious step of just identify if children and young people are using your service because most likely they are. Um, and so those were the sort of four positive things. Um, and then in terms of what the working group decided were the kind of, I guess, um, difficulties that services and products had to look at. Um, firstly, it was around challenging their own commercial interests. Um, so looking at actually what's your business maxim and do you have children and young people written through your corporate social values? Um, and can you do that as a way to change the product or to change the service that you're offering to make it more age appropriate? Um, and then the last one was the difficulty that very particular platform intermediary status can rise, um, can lead to and trying to look at how um, services and products can actually not inappropriately hide behind their intermediary status um, to continue to offer services and products that aren't age appropriate. Um, and so in those kind of six areas, we've had this whole working group operating for a year to develop actual lists of do's and don'ts. What are the tasks you need to do to get children's rights in terms and conditions, to make them offer fair terms, to make them age appropriate, to ensure that you don't um, harm their commercial interest? You know, looking at actually how do you do this and how do you get that right? Um, and that's been the work of this working group for quite a while now. Um, but we are approaching um, the draft of a standard, I think it's safe to say. Slowly, slowly, we're approaching that. Um, but I think it's going to be, when it's released, possibly quite a game changer. Because as Elpesh put out, this is one way to just, you know, make it really easy to do the right thing, which is a type of capacity building in itself. We're going to really tool um, the sector and tool the industry up with a way to, you know, here is how you can do it right. Thank you, Reese. That that's absolutely fascinating, and you can tell exactly why uh, it's taken us so long. When you get that list of things up there, because they are not small issues. Now we have another question here, which I might actually pose to Alpesh. Um, and the way that it's been formed, it says, "Might we be able to use the response to terms and conditions for children as a reform, especially in the online gaming uh, center sector, for application to?" adults as best practice and I'm going to invite you Alpesh to to sort of think of that also more broadly because of I know you've been doing at IEEE a, lo, uh, a lot of work around ethics in general and what about this idea if we work out what's good for kids uh, does that tell us anything about what's good for adults? You know I, I, I love that question that's been on my mind for quite some time especially as we 
think about both this idea of the children's stack, which is something that we've been exploring for quite some time. And, um, you know, as open source is also another mechanism to standardize with an IEEE. I think it's an interesting idea, especially if you're considering that your platform is one that you're looking to license down the road to, to others. Um, and in particular, some of the things, if I were to use the children's stack as an example, you know, many ideas of by design really need to be fully vetted and developed here. And then having the ability to sort of inverse what's happening now in terms of turning things off for a more adult oriented approach versus, you know, the current approach of trying to just dumb things down, if you will, um, you know, may have more of a marketability uh, in, in the future. I think it also depends on what segment you're looking to really focus on and what you're looking to offer. But at the end, I, I think what we are all finding is that the big no-no is trying to take an adult-oriented system and giving it to kids. Mm. You know, that's, that's the big issue, I, I think. The others are ones where when, when we get into the gray, we really need to understand this, what is our true intent? What is our expectation? We, we do need to take, when I hear the, the by design, quite a bit for me, it's, it's let's take a step back and just understand what is our end goal? What are we trying to do for the betterment of what? And too often, I think that's something that we're, we're forgetting uh, when, when things are being designed and we end up doing things because we can, as opposed to, should we be doing it? And Vivan, this goes to your earlier point on, you know, there's been a considerable amount of work being driven by SSIT, um, members of the Global Initiative on um, uh, Ethics of AI Systems, and others where we start thinking about these ideas of nudging, for example. Mm -hmm. And as these technologies start to evolve and nudging plays a bigger and bigger role, how do you manage for that? And will an adult system better cater towards children in this way? Or will you take a children's based approach and have it bubble up? I think these are things that require, you know, closer uh, look at. But I do think that if you went with the former of a nudging system based for children and having transparency in terms of where those decision points came in the nudge, making that accessible to the proper um, players in the ecosystem, the parental ecosystem, that would that could be a good thing. So. Sorry, that's a bit of a broad answer, but I, I, I do like um, the, the thinking behind it. Uh, do you know what? I think it's actually a, f a fantastic answer. And I think, you know, one of the sort of, if you like, the category error, and, and you can see why it was made, was one of the, you know, utopian vision was each one of us would be the same uh, in, online. Uh, but unfortunately, or fortunately, we're not all the same. We have different needs, different requirements, and uh, in the case of children, different rights. So it is a sort of a maturing of the sector to actually have to treat its users in different ways. Um, now, Ephraim, I have a question here, which you are absolutely the person to answer, which is uh, when gathering data um, and, and thinking around terms and conditions for a new service, how important is it to consult the primary stakeholder, in this case, children and youth? I think that um, it is very important. Um, from from the workshops that we've been running, um, a thing that I've I've learned just from trial and error is that the the majority of um, insights that we gain um, as part of this talking to children and um, understanding their points of views and specifically understanding what their what their pain points are um, in the services that they use and um, where they're coming from um, when they're talking to their friends about um, what, what their pain points are. Um, it's important to understand that children do have quite a lot to say um, about certain cultural um, and situational um, aspects of using services that you can't necessarily get from talking to adults about them or even uh, briefing people about what it is that children are said by the literature to um, to require in certain circumstances. Um, I think a good example of this from the workshop that we ran most, most recently um, was when you look at a lot of the uh, literature on uh, how you should draft policy information to people, um, including young people, they say that you should um, 
make sure that it uh, has a formal uh, appearance um, so that it um, builds more trust and um, invites people to uh, to read it as a as a uh, quote unquote serious document. Um, when you actually show children the policies um, that are built that way, uh, they have very different ideas about how how um, how formality comes to play or um, or what it is that invites them to to read or see something. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Um, Reese, I'm just going to finish and I'm aware of the clock ticking down. So I'm going to ask you a very short answer, please. Um, just around the role of child impact assessments, you know, what 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 responsibilities do digital uh, content and service providers have in in, in addressing um, their own service using child impact assessment and 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 the person who's asking has made the point intended and unintended consequences of their service apologies there we go that's a uh, one year on and we're still unmuting ourselves um look i think it's an incredibly interesting question at the moment um there isn't a requirement for um you know, services or products to undertake child impact assessments. And I think that's where a lot of this goes wrong. Like Elpesh was talking earlier about the solutions not being upstream enough and that people just don't think about children and young people until the product is fully developed. Um, and, you know, part of the work we're doing is to really try and, as, as Ephraim put it, make sure that children and young people are seen as stakeholders from the beginning and that their needs and their rights are recognised, including, as Ephraim was pointing out, their right to participate, to be involved, to be heard, um, to help come up with the solutions to co-design. Um, but there is a simple tool that product services companies can use around doing a child impact assessment to actually evaluate, you know, whether it's themselves or every new product that comes on the market from the outset and say, okay, for example, here's a list of commonly known hazards um, when developing products for young people, things that can go wrong. Have you looked at these? Or here are some things you need to consider in your corporate social values. So there's a huge capacity um, for child impact assessments to really start drive that thinking upstream um, and help people develop services and products that, that are right from the get-go. Thank you so much, uh, Rhys. Um, we are in the final couple of minutes of, of our session. Uh, there was a conversation, uh, there was a question about media literacy, and I'm going to abuse the, the role of the chair by saying um, at Five Rights, we are hugely supportive of media literacy, of data literacy, of digital literacy, uh, of all the literacies, but it is not instead of uh, creating a an age-appropriate online world for children in the first place. We mustn't educate them towards uh, a system that is not good for them. Um, and now I really do want to thank uh, the panelists, Reese, Ephraim, Alpesh, thank you so much for your words of wisdom. I do want to thank Katina, who I don't think we said right at the beginning is in fact the chair of our IEEE working group. Uh, Katina, thank you for today and thank you for all that you do uh, on our behalf. And I want to thank uh, the team at IEEE and FIT UN Conference for their support. And mainly, I want to thank the young people who gave us their thoughts and always are our inspiration. We're going to close with another very short video from the young people we spoke to in Southeast England. Goodbye. Thank you very much.